Okay, so our guest lecture for today. Just want to say before we start, welcome. Uh, I think we've got one visitor and a couple of men come in, uh, potential students. Um, gentleman at the back who is from a Swedish university, is that correct? Happened to be passing, well, we pulled him off the street. No, <laughs> but, um, so welcome. Um, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Nicole. Uh, Paul and I and lastly, uh, Michelle, have spent um, yearly visits to uh, Memorial University of Newfoundland. Uh, and in return, Nicole and her colleague Natalie have been here a number of times as well. It's a very interesting relationship and a very fascinating place. And Nicole, as you know, you mentioned earlier this week, um, runs the Centre for Social Enterprise and now has the uh, pleasure of being, of course, Program, program coordinator. Program coordinator for the relatively new uh, MBA in social entrepreneurship and entrepreneurship at Memorial. And we had the pleasure to teach uh, Nicole's students earlier this year, in fact, three or four weeks ago, mm -hmm. actually. So without further ado, uh, welcome thank and thank you. Can everyone hear me? Yeah. Great. So after all of the fun of drawing, hard act to follow, well done, Michelle. Um, it's my pleasure to spend a bit of time with you and we're at the end of the day but we're actually coming back to the beginning of the day thinking about uh, what Neil was presenting this morning about the long view of social innovation and through that I'm going to present some uh, examples, share some stories, uh, four of them um, from rural and rem remote communities um, from Newfoundland and Labrador, where I'm from. I find it's a fairly special place. I'll share with you a little bit about that. And we'll look at, uh, through these four examples, uh, the different ways that people uh, collectively organized for social change. So. so, how many of you have heard of the Broadway play Come From Away? Yes, a few of you have mentioned it to me, having noticed my name and where I'm from. So it's doing great uh, publicity for us, but for those of you who don't know, this is where we're actually located. So there's the, the island um, where I was born, island of Newfoundland, and the more northern part is Labrador. Um, we're the most easterly part of North America. The island of Newfoundland has its own time zone, um, and uh, we are right here. This is the harbor entrance into St. John's. Um, in terms of scale, I could essentially indicate to you where I was born, where I went to school, where I now live, and where I work in this slide. <laughs> um, it, the greater St. John's area has about 200,000 people living there now, but in that broad and vast geography, we have about 520,000 people, which, um, uh, given the, our size, which was about 60% you know, the area of, of Alaska, uh, sorry, of Texas, um, that's not necessarily a lot of people, so the population density isn't particularly high. Um, I show a, a picture of the harbor because it describes, it, rec it shows some of our geography, but also um, explains some of our history and um, activity. Uh, it is a safe harbor, it was a safe place, and um, it represents as well the fisheries, which have been a very important part of the history of Newfoundland and Labrador. You might also see from this picture why we are nicknamed the rock. <laughs> it is very rocky. Um, we, we can grow a mean turnip, but uh, in the past we did have more of a subs uh, subsistence uh, agriculture, now we import about 90% of our fresh produce. If the ferry doesn't come in, um, we have about two or three days supply. So um, it's a bit tricky sometimes and our produce actually doesn't taste very good. Now, we also have small communities. So St. John's, the town, so I'm called the townie, is our largest port. But we have a lot of outport communities. This is Francois. <laughs> Um, spelled Francois, but uh, pronounced obviously a bit differently. Population about 85, no access by road. Um, there is a shop. Uh, apparently there's a post office, and if you believe Google Maps, also a liquor store. So, uh, highly probable. 
So we have some very interesting communities of this size and nature, um, which are surviving, perhaps not thriving. Um, of those 85 people, how many live there all year round? How many have retired there? How many are there seasonally? Here's um, another example, Little Bay Islands. Um, in October, we made the international news with this one. Uh, population 54, soon to be two. Um, the government has been offering people compensation packages. It's actually more affordable to buy people a new house elsewhere in the province than it is to provide services. So after two or three rounds of voting, 90% of the population decided to leave. And a certain, I think, Mike and Georgina uh, Parsons have decided that they're going to stay there and live off the grid. Um, they're very tied to that community. They're only, I think, 52 and 44 years old, respectively. And that's where they plan to retire. So, OK, everybody's decided to leave. That was going to ruin their retirement plans. And they've decided now they're going to make a go of it. And there are a lot of people who are actually watching this because there are a lot of people, pardon me, who would like to stay where they are and are looking for different ways to, uh, to keep their communities alive. Um, this was a, a news uh, article from last year showing that our, with our immigration uh, policies in Canada, our population is increasing. But in the case of Newfoundland and Labrador, our population is already declining. We have a, uh, an older population, and we had 900 more deaths than births last year. I feel I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. I think I've set some of the context. I'd like to take us now back again into a bit of a history uh, lesson and share uh, the first of these four examples um, and also give some context in terms of the kind of system um, the, the society was living in at the time. So we're going back to the late 19th century and a system called the truck system. Does any, is anyone aware or familiar with what a truck system refers to? So we're talking about an economy built on credit. So we have the, the merchant class would get, provide the, the fishermen all of their equipment, maybe clothing for their family and supplies. And at the end, they would take their fish, and sell it. But what would happen would be that the merchants also fixed the prices. So we ended up with communities of people in continual debt. Um, Neil spoke about debt this morning, and it was very crippling for, um, for a lot of people and communities. What you see in this picture here is a, a, salt a salt cod flake. So they'd prepare the fish, lay them out to dry, cover them in the salt. And here we have some people harvesting them. Now, in the context of this system, a very exploitative system, enter Dr. Wilf uh, Wilfred Grenfell. Now, Dr. Grenfell was from England. Um, he was a medical doctor, and uh, I would say it was safe to say something of an adventurer. He joined something called the Royal Mission to Deep Sea Fishermen, and in 1892 went to Labrador. This um, image on, the, on your right is a mat come to the significance of that in a moment. But you can see the tip of the island of Newfoundland there and Labrador. And this was the area he worked in the Labrador Straits and the Great Northern Peninsula um, um, of the island of Newfoundland. So he was there on a mission. Um, it eventually switched from that mission to the deep sea mission uh, to the deep sea fishermen to the Grenfell mission. He would be traveling um, up the coastline in the Strathcona, the, the medical ship. Um, sometimes they would be traveling to reach people by, uh, on snowshoes with um, dog sleds. So again, a very adventurous life. When he arrived, he was appalled at the living conditions of people. And some of those people lived there all year long. Some people only came up for the fishing season. But regardless, his first patient, uh, in terms, if, you, if you believe the legends, said to him, be you a real doctor, because he'd never seen uh, you know, proper medical care before. So he, there he was, you know, commem commemorated on this stamp, again, as someone um, who was uh, sort of pioneering, bringing health care 
to uh, this part of uh, uh, Newfoundland and Labrador, someone who started to establish hospitals. But he didn't stop at that. He realized that he would never achieve his medical mission if he didn't also seek ways to address the socioeconomic situation of people. So one of the things that he did, having come from England and heard about cooperatives and the cooperative movement, was help people establish cooperatives. So this was the first one in Red Bay in 1896. And according to a dramatization, this is what occurred. Dr. Grenfell then suggested his plan. It was this. They would form a company. They would open a store for themselves. Through the store, their furs and fish would be sent to market, and they would get just as big a price for their products as the traders got. They would buy the store supplies at wholesale just as cheaply as the traders could buy them. They would elect one of their number who could keep accounts to be storekeeper. They would buy the things they needed from the store at a reasonable price, and at the end of the year, each would be credited with his share of the profits. In other words, they would organize a cooperative store and trading system and be their own traders and storekeepers. Now, the first community in Red Bay, when they came together and tried to pool what funds they had, realized they didn't have enough funding. So Grenfell, in fact, invested in the first cooperative, had proof of concept, so to speak, and then it continued. They also created a really interesting organization called NONIA, which stands for the Newfoundland Outport Nurses Industrial Association. This woman on the right, she's a hooker, but she is a rug hooker. So, <laughs> little delay on the joke there, wasn't sure it got through. Uh, so a woman in her kitchen uh, preparing uh, a craft, which would then be sold and the proceeds went to hire public health nurse, which they would. So it was a, a means of the community members um, finding what skills they had and creating, again, an industrial association. It was founded in 1920. I love these little tags that show made in Newfoundland, so we never see that anymore. Um, these are not the best pictures, but these are ones that I took when I visited St. Anthony. Um, which was one of the main areas where Dr. Grenfell worked. And these are two examples of these mats. And uh, if you're ever in Newfoundland and find one in a, in a flea market, grab it because they're beautiful, but they're also uh, quite valuable these days. So this is Nonia at a trade store, uh, trade show once upon a time. I can also see some seal pelts in there amongst the, the other handicrafts. This is Nonia now, downtown Water Street. 175 people approximately are still employed. Again, it wouldn't be a full-time salary. It would be a supplement to whatever other income people would have. But it's 100 years in 2020 that they've been around, and a lot of businesses can't, can't say that they've lasted that long. Now, this is uh, or was the co-op in St. Anthony. It closed last January. It was the last of the original Grenfell co-ops to close. Um, in August, they have an offer from our own local grocery called Coleman's. They might actually be opening up again. And they might actually, if they're discussing it now, whether they're going to keep the cooperative model or not. So it may yet spring to life again. In terms of Grenfell's legacy, so some of these retail or grocery operations may, may still have some life left in them. This is the uh, Curtis Memorial Hospital in St. Anthony. Now, Dr. Curtis was Dr. Grenfell's number two. So he took over when Dr. Grenfell uh, ceased his own medical practice, medical activity. Um, one thing about Dr. Grenfell that was quite remarkable was that he was able to draw other people around him. So he was able to move out, to step out of the way and have others continue the mission and continue the work. Um, Dr. Curtis being just one. Dr. Grenfell also used to go on talks. He'd give talks about the work he was doing and the plight um, of people in Labrador and in Newfoundland and became known as a philanthropist. So 
Through those talks, he managed to recruit volunteers to come up for the medical mission and others, because they also um, had uh, open schools and were looking at other forms. I think they opened lumber mills. They were, they were always finding different activity for, uh, for organizing, for the community, trying to find more uh, ways to generate um, activity. Um, the International Grenfell Association still exists today. This is a screenshot from their, uh, their existing website. Now, the mission has changed somewhat. The healthcare system has been taken over by the Labrador Grenfell Regional Health Authority, so the, the public sector. The philanthropic arm still remains, and uh, they provide funding to pro communities with their project, projects in the same region where Dr. Grenfell had a footprint. And uh, the mission is to support the general well-being of those communities. Members of the board of the International Grenfell Association, I think interestingly, come from Newfoundland, Labrador, but also from the Grenfell Association of the UK and Ireland, Grenfell Association of America, Grenfell Association of New England. So there was definitely an impact that Dr. Grenfell had and is continuing through those organizations even today. Now, I'm going to speak of a second person where Dr. Grenfell is something of a legendary a legend. Um, another character who is a little bit more controversial was uh, Sir William Ford Coker. Now, he was born in town, he's from St. John's. He was not from a uh, fishing background, but he did work the wharfs as a, as a, as a boy. And one of the things that he did um, he must have had some sort of char charismatic personality because he, he organized with the boys to have a strike, get better working conditions, better pay. So there was something in him that uh, drove that kind of, I'm, I'm going to organize people. Again, tying back things to the um, exploitative sis truck system, um, one thing that he helped uh, galvanize and uh, create was the Fishermen's Protective Union. Now, in 1907, the year before they were um, uh, established, they'd had a very poor year with the fisheries. So what had already been a terrible situation for the, the, the fishermen was a, was a really bad situation. So he organized in Orange Hall in some Herring Bay, a, a small outport town again, a meeting. And the uh, consensus was to form this union. Um, it had a purpose, um, and I quote from the Marine Historical Archives, and a mission to intervene in the fish business. So disruption, something of a social on an entrepreneur, perhaps. Um, they did look at uh, advocating for the fishery, but they were also interested in education for uh, fishing communities and uh, were also looking at political reform, which in the end was something of their downfall. And where I'm trying to remember, Neil, this morning, there was a, uh, you, you quoted you know, uh, some, the duty for all. So in here, it was a little bit more, more individualistic, shall we say, to each his own, um, in reaction to you know, the situation they'd been living under with the merchants. Now, speaking again of the merchants, they tried to set up their headquarters in St. John's. Of course, that's where the headquarters of many of the merchants also were. They weren't too pleased to have Sir William Coker and the Fishermen's Protective Union around, especially because the FPU decided to form the Union Trading Company. So again, similar to what Grenfell had done, they organized um, their own enterprises so they could intervene in the fish business by starting to do the fish business themselves. In order to deal with the situation in St. John's, they actually built a town, a town which is called Port Union. They established um, shipbuilding. Of course, they had the, the, the fishery there. They built homes for all of the workers. They had a newspaper. They had a movie theater. They had a bakery. The list goes on. Uh, quite remarkable what they built up in a fairly short period of time. Um, they even had their own. Uh, electric power station. I'm going to pause on this one a little bit 
because I think it, uh, on the one hand, shows their desire to be self-sustaining, but it also shows some of their, their ethos and how they did things. Because generating the power, it was, they wanted to have the electricity for the enterprises, but then, of course, for Port Union. But then they were able to provide electricity to other communities nearby. On top of that, when the Depression years hit, what is interesting was how they reacted to that, because they saw that their customers were starting to you know, come off the grid, come off the electricity, and go back to using kerosene lamps. What they decided to do was to enable people to pay for their electricity bills in salt, cod, and turnips. They also um, let people carry their, their debt in terms of their electricity bills for as long as three years without interest. So they, were, they said the only time they wouldn't uh, um, respect that, or the only time they would really cut someone off, was when they knew that someone was unscrupulously trying to get away with not paying for their electricity bills. And well, they could do that because everybody knew everybody, and everybody knew what was going on. So they were finding ways, knowing, again, people in communities, to uh, help people get through a very hard time. This is the Coker bungalow. This is a home where Coker lived in Port Union. Um, he was, I think, a very interesting man in the sense that um, he would invite the fishermen in for tea and, and uh, in to play billiards. But he also had a chandelier from Herod's uh, marble uh, statue, a gift of the Portuguese fishermen. So it was a very, I, I had the, um, the privilege of visiting the Coker bungalow myself just in September. And it was interesting to contrast this facet of the man and the man who organized the strike amongst young men on the, on the wharf. Um, so he, he, because they were in the shipbuilding business and they were trading, he would also get on the ships and where off would they go? They'd come over the, this side, to this side of the pond, as we say, but they also get out, go down to the West Indies. Um, he seemed to have an interesting side. He also got into politics because political reform was part of what they were interested in. Now, where they had succeeded in moving uh, or creating Port Union and getting out of the hair, so to speak, of uh, uh, the merchants in St. John's. They were taking them head on by going to politics, and that did not go over so well, um, though it was certainly impactful and you know, had played an important part in our political history. What he didn't plan too well was succession. So he did have someone, a certain Aaron Bailey, who also lived in the home with his wife um, and uh, who gradually took over the businesses. But after Coker died, he started dismantling the businesses one by one. There's a lot of mystery surrounding. They'd, they'd had a building, a hall, where all of the paperwork, the, the documents, the archives were held. And uh, the rumor has it that someone saw Aaron Bailey sneaking away in the night after having set it on fire. We'll never really know. There are a lot of rumors and a lot of gossip. Um, but uh, Coker does not have the same kind of legacy that uh, Dr. Grenfell had. And we see that to a certain extent in Port Union, which still exists, and they're really trying to revitalize. Okay. Now, I could possibly speak of this as Coker's legacy, because this shows, some, in the Bonavista area, some of the uh, fishermen, or the FPU, uh, locals. So where people in those communities were organizing in smaller groups uh, representing their own communities um, in the Fishermen's Protective Union. I'm going to focus on this area as we get into our third example. Um, we're going to look at uh, the, the town of Bonavista, which is right in this area here. So it used to be that there was lots of fish in Bonavist Harbor, lots of fish right in around here. Uh, not so anymore. Um, with uh, our, the international trawlers and our own um, uh, extraction, shall we say, of this natural resource, um, in July 2nd, on July 2nd, 1992, um, our federal government called on a cod moratorium of the North Atlantic cod fishery. And uh, yeah, we haven't had a commercial fishery for it, 27 years now. 30,000 people overnight were uh, unemployed. It was over 10% of the, the workforce. Here in the picture we have uh, on the right, uh, John Crosby, who at the time was our 
federal um, minister of fisheries, whose plan of, to deal with the fishermen was, well, you could stay in an office or you could go and confront them. You know, the best defense is an offense. Um, he says that he's lucky he didn't end up thrown over the wharf that day. But uh, there was a, certainly a lot of anger and a lot of communities uh, lost activity. Um, in the 10 years that followed the moratorium, population decreased, I think 10%. Um, my generation landed in there um, with one exception. I think uh, I haven't, uh, the people I went to high school have left. Um, So let me see if I can get this to work. So this is the town of Bonavista. So I've, I encourage you to have a look at the, at the buildings. So Bonavista was an important uh, fishing outport. When the cod moratorium was, was called, they really suffered. Um, people left. The buildings, uh, many buildings were left um, abandoned and uh, were left to just fall to pieces. But there was uh, a group of people who called themselves the Bonavista Historic Landscape, or I got that right, the Bonavista Historic Townscape Foundation. And they went around essentially uh, cataloging and recording all of the traditional buildings that you see right here through the lovely drone footage. And uh, in recent years, a serious uh, effort has been, been made to restore some of the buildings um, in the sense that, uh, or with the faith, that by restoring these built assets, people would come home, be attracted to come back. The man in this picture, his name is John Norman. Uh, he was nicknamed the Baron of Bonavista. I like this quote. There's something steampunk about the man and his enterprise. Microchips governing, governing a Victorian machine. Now, what John Norman did was buy up some of these properties that were going to fall to the ground, bought them up for dirt cheap, fixed them up, and started selling them. What he had on his side, on the one hand, was some private investment, but he also decided to, rather than modernize, to maintain the character of the buildings and create jobs um, by keeping some of the traditional ways. So the, the, uh, the shingles on the buildings, on the rooftops, the, um, the window frames, the door frames, um, has created work for people through uh, Bonavista Living. And he also has another enterprise called Bonavista Creative. Now, he may not be the Baron of Bonavista, but one other thing he has done successfully was run for mayor. So, uh, <laughs> he's also taken on Airbnb. I say he, though I, he does represent the whole council. But uh, yeah, actually he's been a bit aggressive. I will use he. Um, <laughs> a bit aggressive with Airbnb because they will, I mean, with what powers they have at the town, if they know that there's an Airbnb, they're not paying taxes, they will take down the street lamps, uh, pull out the sidewalks in front of your property. So it got nation, uh, it was on the CBC News recently for my Canadian uh, colleagues in the room. <laughs> uh, the, the quote is written by one of our local, um, local authors. Um, having met the character that is John Norman, um, Force of nature doesn't do it justice. Um, he's very flamboyant, or I have seen him very flamboyant. He has calmed down somewhat since he's become mayor. But he's, he's very young in a community that's, uh, again, heavily weighted to people who are retirement age or close to retirement age. And uh, I mean, the, just his approach to how I'm going to tear up your sidewalks if you're not paying taxes, that's steampunk. <laughs> so, okay. So there are a number of different properties that are there. I think partly also his youth and that energy and that approach have appealed to a lot of people. They have uh, been successful in re-energizing um, Main Street. So there are enterprises that have come back. A lot of them are artisanal. Uh, 
handmade soaps, for example, but there's also a fitness gym. Um, there's an incubation space, which opened up, I think, about a year and a half ago. Um, and uh, they, again, is this urban legend or outport legend, uh, people in Alberta, maybe with a connection to Newfoundland, Labrador, maybe not, going on Facebook and discovering Bonavista living and then saying, sight unseen, we're going to buy property and we're going to move to Bonavista because that's where we want to live. We want that lifestyle where um, you don't have to lock the door, where you're surrounded by fresh air. Now, maybe they didn't know about the weather that we get um, and that a lot of activity is seasonal, but there are a lot of people young people, a lot of millennials, um, who are attracted by uh, what is happening in Bonavista and by extension, the Bonavista region. Um, there are, well, Port Union isn't too far away. They've opened up um, uh, an artist hub and they're looking at um, attracting artists for residencies. There's Port Rexton, which has a brewery that Usually, often helps a community. Ironically, the, the brewery is located in what used to be the community center, and before that, a school. So they've preserved that building and are bringing a, something of uh, activity um, uh, and life to it again. Uh, there are uh, the first vegetarian cafe, when there were no vegetarians in Newfoundland, was open there. Um, and uh, the Fisher's Loft, um, to individuals, um, CFAs, and come from away, who moved out there uh, about 30 years ago now. Um, they were living there happily when uh, another local uh, um, person who had a bit of a hotel said, we've got, we, we need an extra room, can you take people in for us? And that was the start of them opening Fisher's Loft, uh, which is a number of buildings, um, a conference center, um, they have art exhibits in there. Peggy Fisher is an art historian, so they leverage that. Um, and they're, they're doing quite well, growing local food. And what I found interesting, I, I moderated a panel with the Fishers, with uh, Sonia and Alicia from Port Rexton Brewery, and for, with Dave and Sue from the little cafe. And from hearing them speak, none of them would have considered them, themselves social enterprises or even community enterprises. You know, we were running a business, we run a cafe. But what became very clear in listening to them speak was how by having the three, you had a, very, uh, a much stronger structure than if you just had the one. So it was very integrated and um, uh, they were leveraging off one another's uh, activity and making it stronger. So one other building I'd like to share is the Garrick Theater. So we have in the black and white photo, that was the original. And again, at the, at a, at the peak of the fishery, it was a very active spot. It, they'd have movies played in, in the, the movie theater. People would stay after work, hang out there, eat in town. Again, when the fishery collapsed, this was uh, left abandoned and there was no place for people to go. Even those who would want to stay, um, that um, bit of cultural or that social activity was missing. So. The Garrick has also been restored. It does operate as a movie theater, but they're also uh, it's also a performance space. They have uh, uh, a substantial, a good size uh, meeting room um, and uh, a smaller area for more, uh, more intimate events. And again, it's, it's seasonal activity, but a lot on the go. Okay. This is the fourth example I'm going to share with all of you. Um, again, the island of Newfoundland, now another island called Fogo, Fogo Island. Um, there are a number of different interesting initiatives here, but I'm going to take again, trip down memory lane, history lesson again. Newfoundland um, became part of Canada in 1949. So again, to my fellow Canadians in the room, when we celebrated Canada 150, it was woohoo, Canada 68 for the rest of us. <laughs> and so what we have in the picture here is our first premier, um, Joseph R. R. Smallwood, um, known to Newfoundlanders and Labradorians as Joey, signing the paper that made us all Canadians, or as we like to say, it was the day that Canada joined Newfoundland. <laughs> now, Joey had some particularly interest, or 
particular approach to uh, economic development, and that was through industrialization. Where can we build another factory? Where is there another mine or a pulp and paper plant that we can open? And one of, his, one of the other aspects or characteristics of this was a focus on uh, uh, resettling outport communities and forming larger centers. So here we have an example of people who are literally taken home with them to move to another community. So they'd float the, the property out on the water, bring it up on land again, stick it back down. Now, in Fogo Island, this idea of resettling was not going over very well. People did not want to move. But they needed to find some way to, to anchor themselves, to uh, keep the communities alive. And this is where the Fogo process comes in. Now, what was the Fogo process? It was an experiment. It was 27 documentary films. Um, it was a unique collaboration between the communities on Fogo Island. It's only 25 miles long, kilometers, 25 miles long, and still 11 communities. Um, it was the communities, it was the National Film Board of Canada, and uh, the university, the university where I knew work, we had uh, Memorial University's extension service. And the National Film Board, their uh, involvement was through an initiative called Challenge for Change. This was you know, in the 60s, a certain level of interest in social activism. This was a program that sought to address poverty in different parts of Canada. And the Fogo films, and then the subsequent FOGO process were a part of this initiative. Now, I could tell more, but I can act also show a little snippet from one of the films. I feel like the lights should go out and I should be handing out popcorn. <laughs> okay. So this was the very first of the Fogo Island, Fogo Process films. Challenge for change. Experiment in the role of communications in social change. As part of this experiment, we filmed local people talking about the problems of the changing community and played back these films in that community. We chose Fogo Island as the location for this project for many reasons. The extension service at Memorial University in St. John's, Newfoundland is deeply involved with the needs of the Newfoundland people. One of its community development officers, Fred Earl, was born and raised on Fogo Island. He knows and is known by all his people. We felt that we, as outsiders, could never go into a community without the help of such a person. met other criteria for us as well. We 
wanted to involve ourselves with a community in trouble, and one whose problems are typical of other places, so the results of our project could be applied. And we wanted a community whose people had already begun to organize for change, so we could affect the organization process by improving communication. a fishing community off the northeast coast of Newfoundland, 40 miles north of Gander. An expensive hour and a half ferry ride connects Fogo with the mainland once a day. It was once a relatively prosperous fishery and supply center, but now fishing on Fogo has declined because traditional methods cannot compete with modern technology. A community bypassed by industrialization is feeling its effects. Sixty percent of the people on Fogo receive government welfare. Predator revealed for us some of the complexities of this apparently simple place, where the social structure and communication problems make it difficult to organize for change. Most communication on Fogo is on a person-to-person -person basis. Literacy is limited. The island is 9 miles wide and 16 miles long. It has fewer than 6,000 people living in 10 separate villages, only recently linked by adequate roads. Social and religious differences divide people even within the villages. There is no tradition of local government. The villages are administered by merchants and the clergy. Each of four major religions has its own school system. In its problems of isolation, Fogo is a microcosm of all of Newfoundland, and perhaps of other encapsulated communities that are symbolic islands. All these factors made us feel the need for a new means of communication for interpersonal, intervillage, and island to mainland dialogue. So what was the Fogo process? It was a mirror. They captured video, or film, I should say, and they would play it back to community members. And one of the results of that, where you might have had you know, John over here and Mary over there, who wouldn't talk because Mary remembered how John's great uncle stole her grandfather's goat, or sheep probably would be better, but anyhow. Um, <laughs> they were able to realize that they had a lot in common. And it was a way of also galvanizing that amongst the communities on this small island, they would have to come together to do something. The films were also access, access as, an, as a channel to government, because they had two rules with the FOGO process. One was that if you were in any of the footage, you had complete editorial rights. There is, again, legendary moment, uh, Fred Earl with the filmmaker Colin Lowe, with people of Fogo, and they had to say, okay, we will promise you that if you don't like what we're, what we're doing, we will burn the film. We will burn the film. And then they instituted these rules. If you don't like it, we'll cut it out. If we make it, we'll be sure that Joey and other people in government are going to see it and that they will do something about it. Now, Memorial University, so their role was through people like Fred Earle, who again was embedded in community, was born there, he knew things that an outsider couldn't know about. And he was there for deep listening, as they called it, to really hear what the community wanted, what the community needed, and as opposed to we've got this menu list of different trainings that we can offer you, what do you actually need? I think particularly critical when you were dealing with a population where many people had maybe grade two, grade three education and who weren't very literate. What did people want to know about? Cooperatives. One of the trainings that Memorial University's Extension Services offered was what is a cooperative and how do you start a cooperative? And what did they do in Fogo? They founded the Fogo Island Co-op which is operating still today. Uh, they built their own, their very first boat as a cooperative and built their business and continued to evolve since there. 
Now, has anyone heard of Zeta Cobb? Fogo Island Inn? Okay. Okay. So Zeta Cobb was a little girl in one of those 27 Fogo process films. She was born and raised on Fogo Island, um, family, Fogo Islanders, um, and was sent away, like many of her generation, for an education. And she went on, made her uh, career in IT and finance, came back a wealthy individual, said, I have to do something, I want to do something for my, my community, for Fogo Island, because they talked about 6,000 people in the communities. The number has decreased significantly and is still decreasing. Uh, what we see in terms of a building behind her, that's not the Fogo Island Inn. It's one of the smaller buildings that they've created on the island um, where they host people who are either scholars or artists who are coming from residencies. The Fogo Island Inn is one of the three social businesses of the Shorefast Foundation. So a lot of people even in Newfoundland and Labrador, they know of Zita Cobb and her brother Alan. They don't know necessarily about the Shorefast Foundation. They think, ah, oh, Zita and her brother Alan, they own Fogo Island Inn. Now the Fogo Island Inn, uh, built in similar style to this, Anyone who's heard of it want to guess how much it costs to stay per night? Very, very expensive. I looked it up earlier because I'd remembered the prices from last year. It's gone up. It's $1,975 per night, Canadian dollars, minimum two nights. So they have, a, shall we say, a niche target audience uh, of people who can afford to go there, um, have an authentic experience. Um, they. They uh, market themselves as one of the four corners of the world. If you ha ha are a celebrity, uh, someone who wants to get away from the paparazzi, from the crowds, who can't mill about in the crowds, and you want an authentic experience, Fogo Island is for you. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, I, was, I was asked once to come and translate for a special, a particular guest who sadly got on the plane before our car got there. Um, but I'm sworn to secrecy. I'm not allowed to say who that person was. Um, they took a lot of pains thinking about how they were going to structure the social business. Um, well, one, who their target would be, but the style of the place. It's not like walking into one of the big, um, I was going to say industrial, uh, one of the big chain hotels. Um, it's very much marked by the place where it is. Um, they took paints through the design, the architecture, the furniture, the quilts in every room um, to um, pay a sort of homage to Fogo Island and to the skills there. They've, of course, created jobs. Um, not everybody is a fan. You know, misses up at the inn. You know, what are they doing? But to, to uh, come back to the idea of a three-legged stool, one thing that they are, they are trying to do, recognizing the importance of community and relationships in community, is they formed an economic partnership between the town, between Shorefast Foundation, and the co-op. They're trying to find ways to work together and you know, leverage all of their economic, um, all these different economic engines on the island um, to, again, make it a place that people can still call home. Okay, so those are the four examples. I thought I might leave you with uh, a few points to ponder. Um, what can we learn from these different uh, examples? Uh, what can we learn from these pretty tiny rural and remote communities? And what can they uh, highlight for us when we're talking about organizing or leading social change? So, came up with a number of ideas, but I decided to stay with these. So empowerment, whether that is through ownership, through cooperatives, um, or even through ownership of your own image on film. What can that mean for people who have been um, disenfranchised or who do not have many means or resources? Relationships. These are in no order of priority, but relationships are huge. Um, the, sometimes I think that what makes social innovation and social enterprise, social entrepreneurship, so complex and so challenging is social. It's the relationships. You don't have a playbook. You, you can't project manage and say six months from now, I'll have built the trust in the community and now I can go ahead 
and build whatever enterprise or initiative I have. I think these examples also illustrate how dynamic social change can be. There's, there's, it's very difficult to say that here's a start and here's a finish. And, but it's easier to recognize perhaps that there's an, a constant evolution. And for sustainability, there is always change. Uh, what conditions? What conditions made some of these examples work? Something that we see um, again in social uh, innovation and social entrepreneurship is how can we go to scale? How can we replicate? That can also be particularly challenging. I think, um, in particular, the Fogo process, because the Fogo Island uh, situation was particularly successful. And the thought was, wow, we can take this as a process and go into communities across Canada, and we can do the same thing. Easier said than done. Um, the uh, evidence was there of some successes, maybe some learnings from failure, but it was very difficult to be able to say that there's a, a, a clear cause and effect, that the methodology was always doing things as uh, expected. And certainly there were pr particular conditions in the Fogo Island scenario. One of them was a tipping point, a crisis. The communities were going to have to leave, which spurred things. The access, the close access to government, which in many ways we still have in Newfoundland and Labrador to this day, that's not easily replicable. Um, so there were a number of different conditions which are very, very hard to set up those conditions again and value. By value, I mean what is valued? Was it old buildings that were falling to the ground and recognize that that's a built, there's a built asset there that can be seen either as rubbish to let rot or something that can be brought to life again? And there's also the value of home and communities. I'm thinking in particular again of the case of Fogo Island. I thought I would share this as well. This is from 2017, from a report called Vital Signs. I think it's, it, it shows a particular connection that Newfoundlanders have to their communities and a strong sense of belonging. So in terms of a connection to the province, a strong sense of belonging is felt by 65% of the population surveyed, compared to 53% of Quebecers. So if those of you are familiar, Quebec is a, uh, is a francophone part of the province that wants to separate from Canada. So I found this quite striking, and I think it's fair to say it's, it's contemporary Newfoundland and Labrador, and it comes, it comes from somewhere in the history as well. Okay, last slide. I thought I would be completely remiss not to highlight the fact that these are settler stories, every single one of them. And they take place in a context of colonialism. The name of the island where I was born is Newfoundland. Newfoundland is also an island where the, the people who are biotic no longer exist. Grenfell Mission also ran three residential schools in Labrador. Now, in our Canadian context, thinking of social innovation and processes, ways people are organizing for social change, we're living in a time of truth and reconciliation. So I said I was going to talk about four examples. Maybe this is a fifth one to keep in view. Thank you very much.